Hello, I'm Arunabha Ghosh. I'm the CEO of an independent policy research institution called the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. You would have already seen the presentation by Douglas McMartin on the science behind stratospheric aerosol injection. In my presentation, I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the benefits as well as the risks and the unknowns associated with this category of climate altering technologies that we should keep in mind as we design their research programs and as we design their government systems. My organization, CEW, is an independent research institution based in New Delhi in India, and we work across a range of thematic areas related to climate change and the energy transition and technology, not just in India, but in other emerging economies across the world. And we've been working on the governance of climate altering technologies for about a decade now. In this presentation, I want to talk to you about two big sets of questions. What can we know about stratospheric aerosol injection? And what do we not know or not know enough about? So why should we do this? How should we have strat stratospheric aerosol injections? Um, how much needs to be done? How long for it does it have to be done for? But then who would do it? What incentives would they have? What risks are there? And most importantly, what do we not know that we not know? You've already heard from Doug about the need for major reductions in emissions or the removal of carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, the critical problem that we are faced with today is despite the con commitments that countries have made under the Paris Agreement, we are still on track for well over three degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels compared to the expectation that we could limit warming to well below two degrees. And as that graph shows that either we would have to significantly reduce the emissions or we would have to take carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. If we fail to do that, then we are left with perhaps only one other option in the, in the in the context of rising temperatures, can we reflect sunlight back into this back into space, not that it reach the Earth's surface so as to cool down the planet faced with a climate emergency. Now, why, when we understand that this might be one of the motivations, we have to ask why are injecting of stratospheric aerosols one of the most talked about or researched areas in climate altering technologies? And that you will get from this graphic which kind of evaluates these different climate altering technologies on two graphs, on two axes. Their affordability or relative affordability and their effectiveness, either in terms of getting carbon out of the atmosphere or in terms of uh, reflecting sunlight back into space. And you can see that stratospheric aerosols kind of occupies a sweet spot right there, the, the orange blob uh, in kind of in the center of that graphic where it has sort of relatively decent affordability and relatively good effectiveness compared to many other technologies. Um, and that's maybe one of the reasons why you think that this could be uh, potentially a quick and effective solution. Now, of course, we've not gotten to the risks yet. How would you go about doing it? Uh, the figure on the left-hand side comes from a paper that sort of uh, uh, from 2009 that describe the various ways in which we could potentially put aerosols into the stratosphere, shooting cannons um, or um, having a very, very tall tar uh, to shoot those particles into the stratosphere. But the most talked about um, approach has been about flying aircraft into the stratosphere to be able to deploy that. More recently, the figure from the right hand side is the schematic diagram from a research group at Harvard which is developing a program to send up a balloon with a gondola attached to it into the stratosphere. And the balloon would move um, sort of in a, in, in a pendulum fashion. The gondola would move in a pendulum fashion, creating a wake of about uh, one kilometer length uh, within which those particles could be injected. And then the, the, um, uh, the experiment would measure what, what that perturbation of the stratosphere with these additional uh, uh, aerosols that have been injected, how that would pan out. Now, how much do we have to do? 
Now that's where it gets more and more problematic. Some estimations suggest that depending on how much we deploy the, these uh, particles in different la at different latitudes, whether it's 15 degrees north or south or 30 degrees north or south, over the course of the century, we are talking about trillions of grams of additional sulfur dioxide or sulfate particles, aerosols into the stratosphere. In terms of costing, again, there are a range of costings as that graphic on the right hand side would show you. And um, injecting sulfur dioxide, some estimates say it could be about $34 billion a year. Um, some estimates say it could be more than $100 billion a year. Whether if you're looking at sulfuric acid, again, it varies. Ballpark, you, we are thinking about anywhere in the range of 20 to $200 billion of spending on an annual basis to reduce the insulation by a certain degree of, of warming. How long should we do this? Now, there's another challenge because there is this worry that some scientists project about a termination effect. Think about it as stepping on a spring. When you step on a spring, the spring compresses, but when you step off it, it jumps up. Would that happen if we, as that our graphic shows, if we suddenly stopped injecting stratospheric aerosols, would temperatures suddenly then spike up? And as that um, a graphic on the right hand side shows that we, in that case, we're probably thinking about having to keep doing solar radiation modification over a very long period of time, maybe even 100, 150 years. That brings us to the bigger uncertainties. Who might be doing this? As this graphic shows you, compared to many other research programs, whether it's the Apollo Space Program, whether it's the Manhattan Project, um, estimates of the cost make it uh, for solar radiation modification or stratospheric aerosol injection within the realm of possibility that um, unilaterally a few, uh, one or a few countries could go ahead and do this. So that raises the question, what's the means? What's the motives? What's the opportunity? to do, go ahead and do this. Some countries might do this as a last resort to a climate emergency. Some might want to do it as a first resort um, so that they can keep burning fossil fuels. Some group of countries might think that let's buy some time by cooling down the atmosphere even while we try and figure out other solutions or have the energy transition across the globe. And some might want to do it in response to a localized emergency. The incentives to do this, as I have already said, lie in its relative cheapness, uh, the cost aspect. But there could be the incentive to simply politically signal that we as a few countries or as a single country would go ahead and do it to save the planet, so to speak, if others don't act fast enough on in reducing emissions. Some might want to do it to establish technological lead, lead, lead and some might want to do it because they are faced with climate emergencies and no one's stepping up to help them with anything else. And therefore, the who question uh, raises many different scenarios. It could be done by privately funded research, one or a small number of countries, uh, one large economy acting alone, or even a very small island state welcoming scientists to come use its territory to do this at scale because they just have no other option. Hence, we have to always ask ourselves this question, whether the research and certainly the deployment is national governance or self-governance going to be enough for stratospheric aerosol injection. That raises the question about what risks are there. Material risks center around what we simply haven't got enough of an idea of. We don't know how aerosols will interact in the, in the stratosphere. We don't know what would be the impact on biodiversity. Whether tropical monsoons will come with, will decline and therefore impact agricultural output. We don't know if the ozone layer will get thinner if we inject new particles into the stratosphere. We also have worries about unilateral actions. What if one country went ahead and did it? How would we then counteract it if there were transboundary consequences? Um, and similarly, many countries, especially poor countries that might not be deploying this would be worried about the localized impacts of such experimentation. Similarly, there are ethical concerns about any kind of, at a moral level, interference with nature 
at a planetary scale or ethically opposing commercial control and profiteering over these technologies. There is this moral hazard that if this were effective, would it reduce our incentives to limit emissions of greenhouse gases? Or would we free ride on someone else investing in these technologies as long as it saves all of us? The point is, you can't imagine planetary change without imagining the means. And you can't imagine the means of doing this without imagining the motives. And that's why many countries will demand a say over actions that could have transboundary border impacts. And some would argue that future generations should have a say, so to speak, on what, would, what consequences they would have to deal with. So to close my presentation, I want to focus on a lot of the stuff, a lot of the uncertainties and the unknowns that still need further research. For instance, how will stratospheric aerosol injection be linked to the treaties that we already have? What does it mean for the Paris Agreement, which calls for actions to bring temperatures well or limit temperatures to well below two degrees Celsius? Would stratospheric aerosol injection be treated as a contribution to that agreement? Or would it be treated as a substitute for that agreement and reducing the incentives to limit emissions? How does this link with the broader sustainable development goals in terms of, say, access to water and precipitation, in terms of access, in terms of action not just on climate, but also biodiversity and life on land or life in the sea? These are existing frameworks. And they can't be wished away. And therefore, any new planetary level intervention has to be considered within that broader framework. Similarly, given all these concerns that are there about the risks, about who would do it, with what intentions, we have to ask ourselves, what are the conditions under which stratospheric aerosol injection could be deployed? Could be, would it be, as I was arguing earlier, deployed only as a last resort faced with a severe climate emergency, say three or five years of continuous drought, 25% of a country's population faced with famine because of loss of agricultural output? Or would it be used as a first resort or to buy time? And whatever the steps are taken, what precautions will be there for small scale experiments or large scale experiments or deployment? Then therefore we have to ask ourselves these questions about the thresholds of research and deployment. Some could argue that it's sufficient just to do climate modeling on computers within our laboratories. But scientists could also argue that unless we have tested the engineering as well as the chemistry in the stratosphere, we just don't know enough about not just the upside, but even the downsides. We perhaps need to do the experiments to convince us that we should never go ahead and do and deploy this. But to be able to do experiments of that scale, are we then in the realm of experimentation or are we in the realm of deployment? These are not just scientific questions. These are political, social questions that we need to debate as a broader community. Similarly, there are uncertainties about how do we govern this? And of course, you will hear a lot more about this from Holly in the, her presentation about governance options. But for me, two big governance questions are, who is watching over the research that is undergoing? And how do we increase our knowledge and our information about what is going on? To take one example, I referred to the Harvard experiment, uh, the Scopex um, experiment that is being designed. Um, it has, compared to any efforts in the past, done a lot more in terms of establishing a governance mechanism with a completely separate independent advisory committee. However, there is controversy that the advisory committee <coughs> comprises only of those based in the United States. And you could argue that that is fine because this is, after all, a research group within that territory, within that country that's doing it. But others could argue it is, after all, a, a, an experiment that is along the path of thinking about or developing technologies that will have planetary implications. And therefore, at least the advisory committee, the oversight committee, 
or any kind of governance should have broader representation. These are questions we need to debate. So in the minimum, I call this de minimis transparency. In the minimum, we need transparency. We need, and this is a common principle that has been applied on stratospheric aerosol injection and other climate altering methods or technologies by various different research groups um, in the US, in Europe, and elsewhere. Um, I have written papers along with colleagues in the Asia Pacific that transparency is at the core of any kind of um, uh, stratospheric aerosol injection technology development and deployment. And we need transparency about the research method. We need transparency about any kind of outdoor experiment that is being planned. We need transparency about the funding um, where private funding is three times more than government funding for stratospheric aerosol injection. Um, and we need transparency, of course, about the outputs from such research and the impacts, not just the impacts on temperature, but the impacts on this range of other uncertainties about rainfall, about biodiversity, ozone, and so forth. Because if we are willing to contemplate technological interventions at a planetary scale, we have to also contemplate the human interactions, the political challenges that will emerge at a planetary scale. So let me simply close by this, that these technologies that we are considering occupy a rarefied world of climate science, as well as a very messy world of geopolitics. And we currently have no legitimate way or means of, of governance mechanism to weigh the consequences of the risks of not acting fast enough on climate mitigation or the consequences of the risks of going ahead and deploying climate altering methods such as injecting aerosols into the, into the stratosphere. This is not just a technical debate. This is high politics. And we have currently no means to govern this uncertainty. Thank you very much for your attention.